Welcome, everyone. It's Wednesday afternoon at 5.30 here in Vancouver. I'm Barb Wild, good wine gal who is passionate about all things wine, especially wine from our beautiful province, British Columbia. Today we have with us uh, the fabulous Stephanie Stanley, winemaker at Peak Cellars. Stephanie, uh, her background includes um, uh, her BSc at Brock University, completing the Oniology and Viticulture Cool Climate uh, Program, uh, from which she graduated, I'm not going to say the year, and then she did uh, some amazing um, <laughs> apprentice apprenticeships um, and was mentored um, here in, I guess, here in, in the province. Um, Today we're going to uh, talk about wines from Peak Cellars and specifically terroir of Lake Country, uh, where Peak Cellars and Cars Landing Winery are located. So before we get started, I just want to do a little, we're going to do our uh, classic toast. Rhonda, if you can uh, turn on your camera, you are most welcome to join us. You can unmute all that. But uh, on a count of three, I'm not going to be holding anything. I'm going to do my classic, uh, I've got to press two buttons. So <laughs> please hold up your glasses, raise a toast to, oh, David, it's blurry. Bring it forward. Yeah. Because raise a toast blurry background to... thing. <laughs> Hey, this is great. Raise a toast to Peak Sellers and thanks for joining us. Three, two, one. Cheers. Okay. On that note, I have a short, sweet PowerPoint presentation, which we're going to get underway. And uh, we've got Sid Cross in the waiting room <coughs> there. So uh, can you see that, Cassandra? Yes. Hold on one second. All right. So before we, uh, yeah, we'll just welcome him. Hey, Sid, how's it going? Welcome. We're just about to get started with our presentation. So I'm going to turn it over now to the fabulous Stephanie Stanley uh, from the beginning. Let's just get rid of that and get rid of that. And here we are, Stephanie, you and I together again on Zoom. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Last time was about, uh, what, about two hours? Going yes, that was an back. adventure. Yep. Yep. We, we tasted through the entire media offering uh, from Oryx Peak. Um, and those wines were the reason that we're doing this today. Um, such a cool conversation when wines of this quality and um, style can share um, nuances um, in, into your uh, skill set, you know, terroir. So um, I'm going to let you uh, start uh, telling us just a little bit about you and about the, uh, the wineries that you're involved with. All right, thank you. Oh, well, um, thank you for inviting us to join your happy hour Wednesday nights, Barb. We're really happy to be here and um, for those joining us on the journey and to learn a little bit more about Peak Cellars and our wines. So just a, a wee quick bit about me. Barb gave uh, a nice intro there with my education and sort of some work history. Um, I was lucky to actually find a, a career back like in beautiful Okanagan. I'm born and raised Kelowna girl, so I'm about as local as it gets when it comes to sort of local winemakers and being in Lake Country now. So um, yeah, after university, I mentored with Howard Soon for over 11 years and then spent four years dividing my time between the Okanagan and New Zealand, um, developing a seller skill set and learning new techniques and different technologies and things. Um, and happy to have landed back here in the Okanagan at uh, Peak Cellars. Uh, we've got a, a really cool um, little story in, in our portfolio um, with the styles of wines that we're doing um, and the varieties we've, we've selected. So um, just a, a, a quick history of, of where we've come from. Um, we, uh, the, the story basically started back in about 2010. Our owner, Dennis O'Rourke, who uh, originally is from Edmonton, but has sort of lived in and out of the Okanagan for nearly 50 years. So he has long ties to the Okanagan, particularly Lake Country. He started buying properties along Cars Landing Road. A lot of them were just like sort of that undeveloped scrub that you see in this photo here behind the winery. 
undeveloped land, just pine forest, and some of it was old orchard. So he picked up different parcels, five acres, 10 acres, 15 acres, accumulated a few homes, and eventually accumulated 300 acres. And wow. uh, then sort of had to figure out what to do with it. So um, long story short, he, he, he asked around and uh, determined that it was a beautiful site, the aspect, the slope, which we will see later in photos and I'll discuss a bit more. Um, and the soil up there was a really ideal site for growing some premium fruit uh, for making wines and premium grapes. And so the project originally was supposed to be, so Peak Cellar wasn't originally part of the plan, this winery. Um, the way it started was they were, they planted vineyards in 2013 and 14 and 15. Um, and then in 2015, we started drilling and blasting through the bedrock of our car's landing site to build caves because we had to do the caves first and then everything else was going to get built up around it and the caves project took about three years so by 2016 we've got grapes now that are maturing there our vines are producing fruit and we need uh we need a home to start making wine so hence was the birth of peak sellers uh in january 2016 we started building this winery and it. Uh, it was open in 2016 for, uh, for our first harvest. So that sort of ended up being how the project divided and morphed into two, two wineries. So two wineries. Um, yeah. the, the caves project and the winery that's being built up around there is going to be uh, what we call a work family estate. And we've got our peak sellers winery. So we've got our, we've got our two properties that will have very different um, portfolios. So Peak Cellars is going to be the aromatics, um, different styles of sort of similar varieties, rosés, a blended, uh, a blended red, sort of sort of like fun and cheerful, some complexity, some development, like different sort of fun wines. And the Arut family estate is going to focus on uh, different styles of Chardonnay and Pinot Noir and sort of, you know, multiple tiers of each of those. So very different, very different portfolios. And the new site is also going to be... Um, you know, a big event center, massive restaurant, two different performance areas. So it's it's a it's a big project that hopefully will open sometime late 2023. Oh. Um, but as we know, in the state that we're at, things things are delayed, yeah. materials are delayed with with what's been yeah. going on right now. So it's it's hard to yeah. pinpoint an exact opening date. But that's sort of the gist of the the, the two properties associated with the work family. Um, and both will, we're going to continue running Peak Cellars and making all the same wines we've been making at Peak Cellars, um, with the exception we won't make Pinot Noir and we won't make Oat Chardonnay um, okay. anymore because that will be the focus of the Work family estate. <laughs> so I don't, I don't actually have a map, but if we were to be driving uh, through uh, the area, we're going to come to Peak Cellars first. And then right. we go down the road and we turn, we hang a big right and we drive for another couple of maybe five, I don't know, four kilometers, something like that. And six and a half, seven, okay. it's about 10 minutes. Yep. All right. Yep. And yep. then it's about halfway between like peaks, the, the new winery sites about halfway between peak sellers, which if you haven't been there before, if you're familiar with intrigue, we're right across the street from intrigue. So it's about halfway between, um, between us and 50th parallel. So you'd, you'd pass our vineyards and, and you'd see the big construction on your way to 50th. So, and, yeah. and, uh, and I think my point is it's right along the way uh, and there's, it's right on the corner. So you can't miss it. And a uh, very inviting um, lunch, uh, tasting bar, lunch area. Like you can see right here in this image, this is really where you want to hang out and the road's kind of on that side. So, and this picture is about three years old. So, you know, we need an update. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, we've, we've going on. David had a question about um, the grapes. So they're grown specifically for the Peak Cellar, Cellars brand rather than being sort of a, a second label. Is that correct? Well, we when we planted, like we planted the two sites, we've got about four acres planted on Goldie Road where Peak Cellars Winery is, but our main vineyard site where we planted 100 of the 300 acres, um, we planted varieties that were suitable for, for the climate. And just, and um, so we are quite white focused with Pinot Noir as our main red. Um, so originally we, we planted the grapes that, that Adrian wanted to make wine with and that he thought would do well there. But as, as things have morphed and we've got the two brands, 
Um, like we're hundred percent to state and all Lake country. So the vineyard, we're basically down to the point where we've, we've block designated um, areas that will be peak sellers, grapes, mostly based on variety, um, but also some location in the vineyard where, where we diversify the Pinot Noir into a sparkling or, or red blend and into rosé. So, um, does that yeah, map I mean, that, now, sorry, the, does that the, map that we have going to, going to speak a little bit to the grapes and where they go or is that? Certainly, that, yes, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we do have a good map. So yeah, I guess you could say that the fruit is grown specifically for each, each brand because we've, we've really dialed in the vineyard now that we're going on pushing on almost 10th leaf with a lot of the land, um, which which actually will lead into the discussion with our with our different wines is we're really starting to see the fine nuances between the different uh, geology and soil profiles throughout the vineyard that have allowed us to do some of these special things. Yeah, and that, that's so, what like last year, Barb and I, when we were sampling the Rieslings and she was, you know, we shared with a few people, it was, they're so diverse. It's just, it's excellent. Yeah, yeah. And so a little bit about our site, it's, it's a pretty, it's a pretty special and almost perfect, like ideal site for grapes. We're sort of on a west, southwest, depending on the vineyard, how it undulates through a little bit like a west southwest facing slope. Um, you can see it's, there's another photo that, that will show the steepness, but this one really gives you a good idea of the proximity to the lake. So we have a lot of um, protection uh, or, or temperature mitigation through the summer and the winter. So when in the winter, when the heat's rising up off, off, off the lake, it creates a current that draws the cold air down from the vineyard. And so we have a lot of frost, like, like we don't get cold pockets and frost um, cooling there or anything. Um, so, so it creates that air current. And then in the summer, when the heat is rising up off the vineyard, it actually pulls cooler air in from the lake and helps mitigate some of that intense heat as well. So you can, you can really see the slope there of um, the slope of, of the land. So it does, it does get pretty steep when you've got to walk rows up and down when you're tasting and sampling and, uh, you know, coming harvest. So you definitely get a good workout. A hundred, 110 acres of slopey vineyards is a really good workout. <laughs> yes. Yeah. All right. So, so, so and did, we, we, did we cover enough on this uh, particular slide here? I mean, it's so spectacular. Um, this is what December, November, December, December, January ish, yeah. I would think with 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 sort of that that layer of snow there. So just on the bottom left corner of that photo, you can see there's there. just a wee bit of construction way bottom left, like super, super corner. That's a bit of the stage area um, being constructed on the new construction. Oh, OK. Yeah, just um, where you can see some, oh, some here, this, framing and stuff this, right there. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so that's I've part actually... of the outdoor stage visited the site it's quite incredible much much more whoops sorry much more to come from from that but I'm, I'm, I can't believe how long it's taking uh, but these things take a lot of time it's a huge project huge yeah yeah I mean it's been they started construction on on the, the winery so once we finished the caves we started the production cellar and then yeah. we kept building the layers on top of it. So yeah. the crush pad came next and then the restaurant and the stage areas and yeah there's so an amphitheater. Is the amphitheater yeah. going to sit 600 or something crazy? Like it's, am I, I wrong? I, I don't, I yeah. don't know the numbers. Yeah. 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 So, and, and so what we've seen in, in the, in the site here, um, sort of in the middle right area, you can see where we've just, you see those, some of those single rows, that's our, our terrace block on the yeah. right. So we've got our terraces through there. That's where the Riesling, the terraces dry Riesling comes from. So it's pretty steep there and just one row per one row per terrace. Wow. That's where we have a wee tiny bit of Merlot too, because our owner likes big reds. Um, but what we noticed in, in, in the next slide you'll see is um, there. Fun. So you can see we have a very long, narrow vineyard that runs uh, north to south along the lake. And so in the, in the bottom third, it might be hard to see all the numbers, but in the bottom third of the vineyard, sort of from the bottom left where it says six, that's our block six, and sort of Cut, cuts up just between 15 and 10 and between 19 and 11, sort of through there, we found the profile is a little more heavier clay, um, closer to the old ancient lake bed, because the whole Okanagan Valley used to be an ancient lake called Lake Penticton. 
Um, and as it uh, as the ice dam gave way at McIntyre Bluff and all the water flowed out, all the soft fluffies and the sand and all the stuff went downstream, which is why you've got the, the sandbars and, and the deep sand down at the Black Sage right. Bench and um, right. Tuckle Newitt Road down there. And what stayed behind in, in the more north and lake country is where we got the granite and the heavy rock and the boulder, which is why we've got some of that bedrock that we were able to drill and blast into. So, so that's where we've got. Um, Do you want to tell us our... about the colors, the colors, so that uh, they can yeah. ride, ride along with us on the. So, with with for today's discussion, particularly, we're looking for dark purple, which is the Pinot Gris, and we're looking for green, which is our Rieslings. Um, the one exception is Block Six. I've just noticed looking at it today; it's the wrong color. That should be dark purple as well. That's Pinot Gris as well. So. Um, but you can kind of see like in, in the bottom, we've got um, some more, I guess you could say a little more aromatics and, and things. We've got Pinot Gris down there. We've got um, yeah. Riesling down there a little bit. And then where you see the red, which is Pinot Noir, the block 24 and 25, those yeah. sites there, we're using those for rosés because the, the fruit from there is a little more juicy and, and, and plump. Um, just sort of juicy fruity plump fruit so that makes nice rosé um and then in the middle where you start to see blocks 9 10 11 12 through there and the upper blocks where we have our lower numbers one two three oh, four five know. those upper sections oh, yeah. are a lot more glacial till granite well-drained looser soils and a lot of rock so not not very heavy not a lot of moisture containing moisture holding capacity so it's in the the middle and upper elevations where we've planted um, grapes and designated those blocks for being sort of the high-end premium wines, the Chardonnays, the Pinots, because we can really control how much water goes in the soil. We get sort of smaller cluster size, smaller berries, more concentration um, and with some of the reasons up there. But you can see we've got some dark purple in there too, block 11 and 12. And that's that's our glacial till Pinot Gris. So it's, it's much looser soil and much more concentrated fruit than our classic Pinot Gris. So when um, you say block 11 Riesling, this is it here, right? Yeah, so some, some of the blocks, like block 11 has Riesling and Pinot Gris, block 12 has a bit of Gewürztraminer and um, Pinot Gris. So some of the blocks do have multiple varieties in them, and, and just, some of them are just pure blocks. And just for David, where's the, where's the Gruner? <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Where would the Gruner be on this map? The Gruner is, uh, Gruner is that light blue. So we have yeah. block four, the strip of block four. Yeah. Well, somehow they missed 19. There should be a strip of, of light blue in block in 19. Here. Maybe yeah. that's it. And there. then over a block 35 is our big is our big chunk. That's okay. Our there you go, David. Those are your blocks. <laughs> yeah, and that whole that whole southern end there, the 30s blocks, that's much for the most part, that's actually sort of all a bit um, looser granite like broken granite and uh, soils up that way. So is this is this really laying kind of like north is up at the top? Is that correct? And this is well, that would be more that would be more east up at the top. So block one and two are sort of north. So the, the water's down at this end. Is that correct? The water's down on the um, it. It's where that uh, it's it runs along the bottom of six, seven, along. seventeen. Oh, okay. 18. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's water runs all parallel all right. to the lake. All right. Yeah. So and, uh, yeah. So we can, should should we should we advance? taste? Yeah, and so so if you if you see like Pinot Noir is pretty much our only red, and we are so we basically planted what we figured was um, best for the site, best for our climate, best for the temperatures, the bud break. Um, you know, spring and like how long our season is, and which is why our portfolios, a lot of people, you know, want reds and wonder about reds, but our, our biggest messaging right now is we're 100% lake country and 100% estate. So we, you know, we've got whites and rosés and a lot of things, but we're having a lot of fun with what we're doing with those. Um, and I really also exploring different styles. I also tried a sparkling and that was really lovely. I think it was yes. a sparkling Riesling. Yes. Delicious. I have a quick question here from Sid, who may have to jump off. So I'll. Okay. Um, he's um, sending your praises because Steph, you've managed to capture a bright acidity in um, Rieslings, yet there's also the rich textures that you get from your Pinot Gris and Gortz demeanor. So just 
wondering what, you know, what on the one hand, how you're, you're pulling those two different types of, of, um, uh, of wines out from your grapes. Right. So the, the beautiful thing with our site, that's what we, that's what I love. Like all of our wines we make are dry wines with the exception of one reason that we're going to try later today. But there's, um, there's an intensity and like a, a purity of the fruit because we're, um, because of our, our site and, and the cooler, the cooler nights, like the big diurnal shift, we actually embrace a beautiful natural acidity and sort of lower pHs than you would from the hotter vineyards down south. Um, but with the, with the intensity and the texture and the roundness, um, that also comes from us having a, a longer, like the grapes don't, won't ripen as quickly that you've got more time for complexity and character to develop in the fruit. But there's also in some of the wines, the element of um, slower, cooler fermentations, extra time on lees, um, some barrel contact and barrel work, not to give barrel impression, but to build the shoulders and the broadness of the wine. Um, so yeah, and some of the winemaking, but also blessed just with having having a beautiful site where we get some natural acid retention and lower pH just to give the vibrancy to the wines. Thanks. Yeah, so some yeah winemaking, some winemaking stuff in there. Thank you, Sid, for uh, joining us. Thank you for your questions. It's always a pleasure Sid. to have you here. So, thanks, Cassandra. All right, so um, I've kind of jumped ahead a little bit. We had our lovely map. We were showing all of the the blocks. I'm I'm assuming you use the block numbers when you're like in the in the winery, like you know, putting your tanks and when you start selecting. Yep. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. When we do all our sampling, we do every variety by block. Okay. Um, and uh, when we try to as much as possible keep the blocks unique, unless we know they're going to end up together, because we know we you know no certain blocks are designated for certain things. But right, yeah. So we use the block numbers to denote each individual batch in the tank as well, and and then really get to know the soil profile in that area. Right. And you've yeah. been you've been making wine now for how many years? Three. Is this your third vintage at peak? Yeah. At the peak, uh, I did two harvests in 17 and 18, but three full vintages is like leaving the winemaking since 2019. Okay, so you're yeah. starting to see, you're starting to notice some things of that. Right, yeah. So we have a, so uh, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. We'll talk at the same time. We have yeah. pictures here of Pinot Gris and you wanna maybe chat a little bit about. Yeah. So, um, so the, the photo on the right actually, so uh, is, they're both actually pictures of Pinot Gris, uh, but the photo on the right is what Pinot Gris looks like before it starts to go into Veraison and soften and actually develop color. And then on the left is that you see the cluster slowly, berry by berry, start developing, uh, developing some of that color. Pinot Gris is a very um, tight clustered variety. So it's very important to have, you can see here, we've got good leaf pull and like fruit exposure which allows for airflow through the canopy. If we ever get moisture or rain, it helps dry out the canopy, but it also allows for good um, spray penetration and protection against disease pressure. Because the berries touch and they're so tight, um, disease is a lot, there's a lot more pressure in Pinot Gris than something with like a, a, a looser ganglier cluster like Gruner Veltliner or, or like Merlot or something like that. So, um, so that's why the canopy is so open. Um, but this, this picture actually leads into discussion with the sort of the first wine um, in, our, in our flight of Pinot Gris is our skin kissed Pinot Gris. So commonly, I think, it's, I think it's changing now. The last several years, a lot more people are exploring skin contact with Pinot Gris um, to give it sort of that, some of that peachy coppery color. Um, but if people that have never seen fruit before, this is actually where it comes from. Um, that Pinot Gris looks very quite similar to Pinot Noir. It's not quite as dark, but the whole cluster is purple and it's got some pigment to it. And so we thought we'd, um, we'd showcase that in, in one of our wines and did an overnight, a very gentle, like whole cluster overnight um, soak in the press, just to get a, a kiss of that color to extract some of that peachy pinky skin tone to it. Um, I also, it also gave like a wee hint of a texture. It just gave the wine a bit of like presence and depth on the palate. Um, but it's this sort of candied, herbal, savory, uh, delicious, refreshing wine. Um, really versatile with a lot of food. Uh, and when paired with stuff that's even salty, like if you do uh, a, a 
prosciutto fig sort of manchego cheese pizza yeah. or something like that the salt really accentuates and brings a lot of fruit out in the wine so well, this was I, this was our first yeah it was our first vintage and we you know we struck double gold um, later in the year with uh, golds at two significant awards national awards for us um, and it's it's totally sold out and we've been waiting for glass to bottle our new vintage but I did hold four cases back for the good wine gal event if, uh, if people want to purchase afterwards we can we've still got some set aside but then i've got to release it to the masses because all the staff want to buy whatever's left <laughs> i don't blame them it's delicious so i did jump ahead just to show color in the bottle because it's such a gorgeous color like and and uh, uh you know relevant to that conversation but i'm just going to pop back because this is in fact the uh, uh, where you spend a lot of time this is this is the cellar. It, there's there's parts of it that are quite modular where we decorate with tanks and barrels and stuff to create interesting spaces if we need to do private dinners or something. But it's it's a really um, it's a really nifty little cellar to work in. It's not tight and compressed, but it's compact enough that everything is very efficient. You know, a couple hoses and a pump. I can have stuff running while this is a view from the catwalk just outside my office. Um, so if I've got a pump running, I can check tank tops. I can see what's happening down on the floor. If I've got to do something in the lab or in my office, um, and there's not great distances and everything's all in one room. So you really can see everything going on. Yeah. Um, so we've, we've got a nice variety of, of tank sizes from sort of 1500 liters to 10,000 liters, which really gives us good flexibility to keep all the different blocks as separate as possible if we want to just see what that block is doing or do yeast trials or, or different things um, before sort of before we blend them together. So we really can dial in a lot of like boutique sort of small craft winemaking. And then you can see we, we have, you know, about 40 barrels or so we've got a small barrel program. Um, none of it's new oak. Uh, usually one, two, three year old, and that's for some of our wines, our Glacial Till Pinot Gris that we'll taste, um, our Gruner Veltliner, and a bit of our Broken Grant, a bit of Gewurztraminer, but it's all for, for texture and body and like broadness in the palate. It's not to give any kind of oak, oak impression or anything. So some extended lease contact and stirring for sort of three, four months after harvest before it's blended. Um, yeah. What's your total production? I mean, these are there's quite a few there's quite a few tanks here. Yeah, we're, we're probably about ten thousand cases awesome. on average. Yep, yep. Awesome yeah, and, and both growing. Sites, both sites will be about the same. Sorry, I said awesome and growing. Yes, yeah. And I love yeah. to well, see all the mechanics, uh, you know, uh, showing the different, you know, stainless steel whites versus slightly oak whites. So you're seeing the tools of your trade and and you know. Your skill yeah. is the secret ingredient to uh, making these wines amazing. So yeah, and what we can't see in there is our teeny tiny, our one single little concrete pyramid tank. It holds a whole 600 liters. Oh. Um, we bought one of those and have tried to pass as many wines through there, and it, it really is incredible. Um, a stainless steel versus neutral oak versus concrete fermentation, all originating from the same tank with the same yeast. How different. The textural expression and the wine expression is so we we'd like to explore getting into some more concrete um because it does it does really beautiful things for the wine right right i was excited to read that all right uh so we don't see the press but i'm assuming it's a pneumatic press and special... yeah, just behind us there it's it's a small little modular crush pad we've got a we've got about a six Back ton uh, pneumatic press um a little incline conveyor that that the shaker the shaker table feeds the incline conveyor that feeds the press to keep everything sort of really gentle and whole bunch um we have a destemmer that we use for you know a bit of our red and some gewurztraminer because we do some skin fermentation with gewurztraminer as a component for our classic blend um yeah uh, yeah, so just a few bits of equipment, quite modular, that we can just move things around and set, do different setups as needed, depending on how we want to process. So, and I think it's really important to highlight, you know, hand harvest, careful, gentle treatment in the winery. These are some of the secrets to making quality wine, um, you know. And of course, then we've got our BC uh, moniker for in the north for beautiful acidity, and then we've got someone with the experience around cool climate. 
um, you know, winemaking, uh, viticulture. You guys have done a huge amount of work on soil evaluation. So this is really like science and art together in a great way. Yes. Yeah. All right, so yeah. shall I move forward now? We've, we've kind of looked a little bit at Sunkist here. Uh, was there anything else we need to add to the story other than there's still some cases there and please order your wine now? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I mean, it was, you know, uh, with a lot of these little things that we're trying out, we're seeing actually, you know, it's an opportunity to see if a certain style works or not, what's popular. And, and this one was clearly uh, very popular, um, especially with Pinot Gris naysayers that are now Pinot Gris lovers because they love Skin Kissed. Uh, so the 2021 production, we'll see a double doubling in volume. We'll probably be doing about 750 cases of the 2021. So there'll be more of it to go around, more to love. Nice. And uh, quantity, do you think this is going to be a style we'll be seeing more of at 388 cases? Is that... Yep. Yeah. So 2021's doubled, and then it'll probably hold, uh, hold around that, around the seven, you know, depending on vintage and like this year might... Because it, it's again, it's a few particular blocks we've designated for this. Yeah. So we'll see what's happened now with, um, you know, with the extreme heat and the vine stress last year, uh, the extreme cold we had for ten days. So we'll see what the winter damage, winter damage. There's the German accent. Um, winter, damage. winter damage does, and um, and now it's a bit of cool spring. This morning I heard the helicopters going for the cherries because it hit minus three again. So. We'll just see what kind of crop we end up with this year. So, but that's that's the risk of farming, and um, and we just you know we deal we deal with we we play the hand we're dealt and make the best yeah. wines we can. And so David David had a quick question here um, about uh, you mentioned that all the wines were dry except for yeah. one, and he just wondered if that was a stylistic choice or something that you you think the marketplace has desired. Um. I think for us, it's a stylistic choice. Uh, there's enough, I guess there's enough sweet wine out there, but we also find just with the way we're making our wines and, and you know, making the pick decisions in the vineyard, being very delicate and gentle with how we handle the fruit um, and to drive like a, a beautiful intensity in the character that it doesn't actually really need any sugar to taste, to taste delicious. Um, and uh, I think, I think there's just been a preference here that, you know what, I don't necessarily know if the market needs it, but it's, you know, we don't all need, you know, not everyone needs to make sweet wine. We don't all need to make the same wine. And we've just really enjoyed the wines that we've been making in, in a dry style. You know, there are a few that have arrested ferment just for a sugar balance, um, Argovertstraminer and the Rieslings, but they're very well balanced with the acidity or it's, it's, um, it's still a low enough sugar you know, residual sugar amount that the wines are still dry. And I think a lot of that, you know, for convert streaming and reason particularly is to, to beat down the old stereotype of people assuming convert streamers and reasons are sweet. So they don't even want to try them, but they, they need to open their mind and try different styles to realize that they can be so delicious, right? Like to, you know, kind of reinvent the wheel, I guess, for Riesling and convert streamer. I think that's what the market really needs. And, and, um, you know, opening people's eyes to the different styles, which which is sort of why we're we're doing what we're doing here now with tonight. We've got three Pinot Gris and we've got three Rieslings in our portfolio. We also have two different Gewurz trainers, and um, one's actually quite dry compared to compared to the other one. So, yeah, it's just it's just I guess the preference of the house. We just we enjoy all our dry wines. I also I also uh, um, think that, you know, we also have an homage to, you know, Germany or we have an homage to Alsace and then we have to find our style. And I think uh, the Okanagan's young enough um, and perhaps um, not maverick, but um, personal style, like you said, expressing your, your talent in a style that you're recognizing is, you know, where we need to go. So I, I get excited about um not really necessarily that it's sweet or dry but what does it go with that's going to elevate that experience right and so i can do anything with you know what are we having and then oh now i know what wine we're going to have with it so yeah. yeah what's been really interesting is um red wine drinkers actually they think they don't like whites but then when they taste our whites and they taste dry whites they actually now like whites so i think again it's that it's that preconception or stereotype that whites are sweet and I don't like sweet so I only drink red 
Um, and we've, we've had, a, we've had a lot of like aha moments and turnover with people saying, you know, I don't, I don't drink, I don't drink white. So I'm like, well, try, try some dry whites and they realize they like them. So it's, it's yeah. dialing in what it is about white. They don't like, and then yeah. and they realize like our whole portfolio is dry. We're, you know, we've won them. <laughs> well, and you know, there's a, a lot of work we have to do in wine. And, and that is like, you know, wine isn't just a cocktail. Wine is uh, something that enhances your experience of whatever you're eating. And I think we don't talk about that enough. That's my humble opinion. But um, I think making wines like these are wines that call out for, with their complexity and their acidity, it's like they call out for op opportunities like and quite a wide variety. What I kind of noticed as I was going through is like great pairings with lots of different styles of cuisine and certainly not limiting in any way. Yeah. And just how much the wine and the food change each other and yeah. and bring out different character and different flavor and um just a whole different experience than just just drinking the wine yeah so this one is a style i haven't tried yet correct the pinot gris 2020 yeah i think you would have had previous vintages like 2019 but this is our classic pinot gris this is the one original pinot gris style we used to make um it typically always has between sort of 10 to 20 percent very neutral oak it was always again to build build broadness and complexity in the palette uh, without being oaky, just to, to, you know, a different style than a lot of other Pinot Gris in the Okanagan. Yeah. Um, this is sort of a very popular, very versatile, very easy wine. There's that beautiful, beautiful apple and some spice and ginger and like, you know, that grapefruit and different herbal characters and um, uh, just, a, just a really easy, fun, classic Pinot Gris. But again, like it's dry. The, the residual sugars on most of these wines, with the exception of some Riesling and Gewürztraminer, are typically two grams or below. Wow. Um, Super dry. So you can just really see how much, <laughs> how much flavor and intensity you can, you know, you can, right. you can get with the right, right. Uh, pick decision, the right, you know, how you, how you mature and grow your fruit and how you handle it in the winery. And so... Wow. What a great price. And I saw peel and eat and I was like, oh yeah, that would, that would be my number. That would be delicious. Yeah. All right. So yeah. So the glacial till Pinot Gris, um, like the skin kiss Pinot Gris, the 2020 was the first, uh, first production of it. So, uh, yeah, we diversified our Pinot Gris quite a bit in 2020 and tried some different things and all have been successful. So the glacial till Pinot Gris, um, I've had a long love affair with Alsatian wines, particularly Gewürztraminer, but when after I discovered Gewürz, I started discovering other Alsatian wines and really enjoyed the oiliness, the viscosity, the weight, the richness, and how over time they got even better and more interesting. So the Glacial Till Pinot Gris is actually made with the intention of it, of, of cellaring it and watching it evolve and age. Um, it has... Uh, it comes from those like that block 11 and 12, which is that middle section of the vineyard where you've got more glacial till like soil. So they're looser, rockier gravel, not a lot of um, moisture holding capacity. And what we noticed in 2020 is they actually really did stand out as smaller clusters, smaller berries. And we thought this is this would be the two blocks to really sort of do something special with and, and get more depth and complexity and concentration out of them. So. Um, also a very, um, so how we processed it in the winery was a very long, slow pressure, like a um, long, slow cycle in the press, um, very, very minor increments. So it's almost like we put it in there and kind of just let it press out a lot under its own weight for a while before we started adding any more pressure. And that just really gave it more that unctuous oily like really focused on the extracts and and, and the concentration in in the wine and i think just a bit of extra time on that skin would have extracted a bit of texture and, and flavor character as well and then in the winery um probably about 40 percent of it was fermented in one and two year old uh, french oak so it's all french oak and then both in the tank and the barrels post ferment, it had about three months of extra lease contact. It's sort of weekly wow. stirring just to really build that body and that richness. Wow. And then once we bottled it, um, we didn't release it for about four or five months because I did want to give it some time just to settle and start to age. Because I, I do really believe Pinot Gris and Gewurztraminer, I mean, the Rieslings we know age well, but those two specifically, at least a year after they're bottled, they're even better when they're, than when they're young, so. It's I like, noticed, yeah, that's 
oh, sorry to interrupt. Um, this Pinot Gris sounds like it, it costs a lot more to make, yet you've priced it at the same price point. Um, that's an interesting choice. It's price. It's at the same price point as the Skin Kiss because we kind we kind of have a bit of a, a you know we've got our classic series and then our tiered series. Um, again, it was just kind of an exploratory, seeing what we could you know what we could do, and um, you know, but we also didn't want to necessarily outprice ourselves with yeah. with something before people had a chance to try it. And, right. Yeah, and, for sure. You know, bait them in, <laughs> bait them in, and then. Um, well, hook, line, and sinker. But but it, you know, for uh, for Pinot Gris, for some for people, like, you know, um, paying thirty dollars for Pinot Gris, you might not expect people would do that. But they don't even they don't even bat an eye. So yeah, I'm thinking um, of of you know, like Poplar Grove's priced around twenty. Um, Gray Monk, not to compare, you know, I'm comparing apples yeah. and oranges, but a lot of people are are they those are the ones that they kind of. 20 bucks is, is enough for that. Well, this, you know, Cassandra, so, yeah. so the Pinot Gris, the sort of, I want to say generic, but the sort of house classic, Pinot, the classic. classic yeah. Pinot Gris is 18, whereas the Glacial Till and the Sunkist are premium. Because gotcha. they're, yeah. That makes a lot more sense now that I see the other one, because I was thinking. That's okay. I had, um, I think I confused the three of them. There we go. Thank uh. you. I'm straightened. Well, this becomes this becomes the challenge of doing three Pinot Gris. Is like, all right, there's going to be a test after, and will you be able to answer the questions? So it's like, I don't know, but it's lovely, and I think the next step on this conversation with Stephanie is, should she come to Vancouver, and should we have the opportunity to go and kind of do the lineup, taste them together, go through it, and kind of let it resonate because it's you know we're not going to open six bottles all at once but it's really yeah uh, have like a bit of a trade event or something yeah yeah um, or we or we yeah. come and visit you there you go yeah. there we go um the other thing about this wine is uh she's well we, we've she's a she um the, the fun thing if we may say this is the joke around the winery is it said she's got balls she's a big wine um she's got some structure she's got some intensity and this is sort of a, a white wine for dishes that you may typically pair red wines with, but we don't have a big red wine portfolio, but this has, this has the weight and the structure and the intensity to pair up with like, you know, filet mignon or bigger, richer dishes like duck breast and, and things like that. It's, it's got the weight to match. So um, that's sort of our, our white red wine option. <laughs> Well, I think that's, uh, again, another one of those experiences that everyone's waiting to have is like, close your eyes and, you know, what is it? And it's like, hmm, uh, blind tasting, although with whites and reds, you can see what's in the glass, but the experience of it with, with the steak, that's a fantastic idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, so shall we talk about Riesling? I know this is a, well, this is a love of yours. It's also a love of mine. And Pinot you know, Alsatian wines, I think we kind of met in a few places how how um, delicious, you know, and how informative Alsace has been for us, so. Yeah. So yeah, Riesling in general has always been, it's a, it's a favorite variety of mine. Um, probably even roots back to as being as a kid. Um, I joke around and tell people I'm an acid head. Um, it kind of sparks their interest, but it's not, it's not the acid that they think I mean. I should so, have used that. I should have used that to promote the session. I hey, mean, acid head stuff. Acid head winemaker. Yeah. Um, I've always loved that sour tart flavor. Salt and vinegar chips were my favorite. Sour candies. Still eat those. I still eat all those. Um, I've, I've progressed beyond pouring straight white vinegar on my salad as a kid because I hated creamy dressing. So, but I've always liked that tart, sour flavor. Um, and also maybe being German, maybe it's in my DNA, who knows, but I, I love Riesling. And I think it's, it's far too underappreciated and I don't like the stereotype that people have about Riesling. So yeah. we're really trying to, moving forward, Riesling is going to kind of be the rock star of peak sellers with the basically the four different styles we make because we have the sparkling Riesling that's a traditional method bottle so fermented. So Riesling is going to be a rock star here. Um, and we've got some, we got, you know, it's, it's, it's the most versatile variety in the world as far as I'm concerned from sparkling to dry to various different acid sugar balances to ice wine, right? 
um, which gives you such an array of opportunity for pairing with food and having those different experiences. So, um, so yeah, I think people, people need to re revisit Riesling because it's, it's more than just, um, Black Tower and Blue Nun and Lieb from the all that yeah. the eighties and nineties, the stereotype that they created for us. So, yeah. Yeah. So this well, is the Germans, Paris. they kept all the good stuff in Germany, right? They export the big, <laughs> the old stuff. I think everybody else does. So oh, it's crazy. But you know, I think there's a couple of things. One is we're getting vineyard specific. And uh, two, we're gonna start talking about how things can become age worthy. And I, I, I you know we're young still again we're not 400 years old or 40 years old or something like that so you know I think we've got some some room here yeah so the terraces dry Riesling um so from that photo before the terrace block although it back. sits I'll just take us oh, we back can. Yep. yeah oh here we go the so block 20 I don't know why it's whited out there's no color on it but block 20 oh this um, one yeah, so the bottom half or bottom two thirds is Riesling and the top bit of it is Merlot. So while it sits in that, that bowl of where we've got the heavier clay-like soils right, um, and probably a cooler spot in the vineyard, you would think being lower and closer to the lake, it actually being terraced, it creates sort of a bit, a bit of a bowl-like shape. Well, which this was the terrace the here, right? That's the terrace there, yeah. So it actually, it's it's quite a steep section there. So it actually accumulates and, and, and gathers up a lot of heat throughout the day. And that bowl actually is what helps it, um, helps it keep ripening and gives us those beautiful developed flavors. Cool. And it's one of the first two blocks usually that we harvest every year. So it's got beautiful intensity, really small clusters um, and small berries. So with this one, uh, I explored something a little bit different in, uh, in the winery. Um, I've heard a lot of different people doing really long, slow, drawn out ferments, cool ferments on Riesling, sometimes even up to three months. I wasn't that brazen because I get nervous when things go slow um, mm. compared to what I'm compared to what I'm used to. So um, so we turned the temperature down to about eight or nine degrees and drew this temp the fermentation out over about six weeks and let it ferment completely bone dry. So, I mean, the, the specs on this wine are like brazen acidity to like zero residual sugar. It's like one and a half grams. Wow. Um, but that extra time during fermentation with the lees, like that slow ferment. So the lees and the yeast were kind of just stirring and churning through the ferment, developed a, a big intensity and a, and a big mouthfeel, like in some structure and some, some weight to it. So while the pH is below three and the acids is screaming 9.7, I think, and the sugar is 1.5, that the, the intensity in the body really embraces that racy acidity and is just a, a huge intense punch of like, uh, of Riesling and it, and it really works. It's not like sucking a, a lemon rind or bitter or sour. It's just a beautiful balance and, um, is has gone wonderful with a lot of different food dishes I've been trying. I also know it's probably a small a small batch compared to others. You it's know, a wee batch. It was 200 only 200 cases. cases. Yeah. 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 But so. exciting and exciting to see how that develops over time because um, that dry tarts and all those complex flavors and structure. I mean, it just will be interesting in 10 years if you are able to hold any back. But you know, mm -hmm. uh, I'll be there to try it. <laughs> well, yeah, we do have what we have started for the last few years is um, like our Gewurztraminers or Rieslings, the Glacial Till Pinot Gris, and even our Goldie White, which is a, it's a co-fermented white blend, but it's Pinot Gris, Riesling, and Gewurztraminer. So all three interesting varieties that will age well, but also are like classic Alsatian style blends. We've put some of that away in the library to exactly just watch how it evolves and then every few years do an event with it or do a release or have some interesting vertical tasting to be able to offer. So Perfect. we have actually some Rieslings and Gewurz demeanors that date back to our first vintage 2015, which was actually just made in a tiny little apple shack. So wow. those are some really, in, there's some really interesting wines to see how the Gewurzes have changed over the years and just yeah. how they've aged is a really interesting experience. Yeah. Cool. That's very exciting. Yeah. yeah. So here we have our classic 2020 Riesling, again, an yep. award-winning wine. And uh, you want to tell us a little bit about this one? 
Yeah, so when we, when we call our, our, our wines our classics, is these were the original styles that we've made from the beginning when we only made one of each. Um, so it's a blend of sort of a lot of different blocks throughout the vineyard, mostly clone 239 and a bit of 21B. Um, and the, the sugar balance that we attain in the wine or retain in the wine to match the acid, it's, um, it's natural sugar. So we do an arrested ferment to, to dial in and, and stop the ferment and keep some of that natural sugar, which I think having some of that natural flavor all adds to the, the complexity of the wine versus fermenting it completely dry and then just adding raw sugar, like um, processed sugar back. So everything's sort of like really dialed in. Um, and again, like our, our site for Riesling being cooler nights, longer growing season, because yeah. you, you know, you get, you can kind of get the maturity and the acidity and the sugar in the right spot, but if it goes a bit slower, that's when it starts to fill in and you get more of that complexity and that flavor development. Mm. How long can the grapes hang on the vine where you are? Um, we're usually, Rieslings are usually coming in sort of, uh, some, some of the blocks that, um, that start by break a bit sooner, because the one block that we'll talk about last, or block 11, um, it's got an, like this interesting underground water source, so it actually opens up sooner than the rest, um, and we usually harvest that a bit earlier, but sort of like, it's usually some of the last white we pick. Because okay. we've got, you know, Pinot Gris that ripens pretty early and then Gewurz Tremino, the acid falls out pretty, pretty early. So, and finding that balance in between. Um, but you, we're usually done harvest by the middle of October. So usually by end of September, early okay. October is when we're picking our Riesling. So, okay. yeah. yeah. So, so beautiful, so yeah. classic, you know, yeah. I like this as the story a little bit about some concrete egg. Stuff. Yep, there was a little, this was the first year we did, we, you know, we had a tank of Riesling, so we did a bit of, we did a uh, concrete, um, a neutral barrel, and just a tank, um, just to see what the differences would be in, uh, in the profile of the wine, um, and th the concrete was just amazing, the, the richness that it had compared to the stainless steel and, and the barrel was amazing, so, wow. so it's just like a wee smidge of concrete um, in that one but we really liked what it did. Um, the acid sugar balance, we're usually pretty close to like same, same, sort of like a one-to-one. -one. Um, and a gram of sugar has much less impact than a gram of acid does in wine. So, uh, so when, when they're that close, you know it's actually probably gonna taste pretty, pretty dry because um, it's got a good balance. So the acid on this is probably, uh, I'm trying to remember if it's about eight point. 8.7 and the sugar is 8.2 or something like that. Like they're a half a gram different, but the acid's a bit higher. Yeah. So you get that mid palate, you get a different, uh, different aromatics. You get a bit of a mid palate tropical sort of sweetness and that honeysuckle and, and canned pineapple and things. But then the finish still is, is a clean, crisp finish. It's not cloying. It's not your, what people expect to be a sweet yeah. Riesling. So um, crab cakes. Again, really, really versatile crab cakes and, and tacos and anything with a wee bit of heat and some ceviche and some you know pepper flakes and a bit of spice and chili and things like yeah. that. Yeah. Um, and a great price. price. Back up my, my notes. I'm not sure if, if this was from from your original, but there were there was Korean pancakes. Yeah. Yep. Yep. With some of that, you know, that spring onion and a bit of that heat and you drizzle it in a little bit of uh, like soy sauce or tamari or something like that with that salt and I would really bring it out. Yeah. Come on guys, sauerkraut and, uh, and burst, brought burst yeah. with a little schmetzle. Pork, pork and <laughs> okay, schmetzle. cheese, cheese dumplings. All right. Shall we move up? So 910 cases. So staple, you know, this is yep. a, a going to be a consistent brand in their wine in the, in the, um, offering. And da, 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 da. do you want us to go back to the block 11? Should we just refresh? Yeah, we can go back to the block 11. Yep. There. So block 11 was here. Yeah. Yep. So there was, there was a little bit of like an underground river or stream or something that used to kind of run through a lot of that section of the vineyard. So we obviously didn't have to irrigate it a lot, but being that it, um, has uh, lower moisture holding capacity. Um, you know, it didn't retain a lot of water and make fat grapes, but 
what it did is the soils warmed up sooner. And so we were finding that block was actually starting to mature earlier than a lot of the rest of the vineyard, a lot of the rest of the using blocks. And it, um, it ends up being one of the first, sometimes one of the first that we harvest as well. Um, Cause you don't, you don't want it, it. It's designed to be a little bit lower alcohol as well. If you, you know, peg it with the, with the right sugar and with the amount of residual sugar we leave. Um, 2021 is going to be an exception for everything because of the heat spike. So the, while the pH is look numbers wise a bit higher, the wines actually still have a really nice natural vibrancy and acidity to them. So, um, awesome. but the block 11 Riesling is the one that, um, we started doing as our, as our off dry style. So it is an arrested ferment, um, usually with around sort of that 27 to 32 grams per liter residual sugar. But again, with the acid being typically around 9.5 to 9.7, um, a lot of people, when they taste the wine psalms or develop palates or something like that, just, just to be curious to see what they think of the wine, a lot of them only guess, you know, like 17 to 20. So when they hear it's actually as high as it is, they're shocked because it's got yeah. such good balance. I think yeah. that's the beauty of the acidity story is that, you know, it masks sweetness or some part of it has a balance that centers elsewhere centers less sweet because of because of the components yeah so this the food pairings like obviously any you know sushis and asian and spicy and indian like anything with some heat and and that you need the like some spice and stuff that the sweetness will balance really well um or or intensely flavored aged cheddars manchegos you know big big heavy uh intensely flavored cheeses and things like that and other foods it's a beautiful match Yum. It's, Yum. I, I just love, I just love that fine, elegant balance that keeps you coming back to. It's just, it's always a, a question. It's like, hmm. And to your point, a little heat goes a long way, right? So yeah. this is the offer, ladies and gents. Uh, it is online. It is available until the 27th. It is three and three. This is the terroir series. We totally recommend this to everyone. The price is so right. Comes with a, you know, two for one tasting at the winery. And uh, if you're not from around these parts where wine's being shipped, then you're local. And it's a, what was it? A tasting of the tasting of the week or something? Yeah. Somebody? So if you're, if you're able to um, pick up locally, uh, we're offering like a complimentary tasting when you come to the winery to pick up. Um, that we normally, I think the select tasting, that's uh, usually a $10 charge. Um, if you're, if you're shipping, um, there is a, a two for one voucher for a wine and cheese experience at the winery. So it's a $50 value. That's, that's only $25. So when you, when you sign up and pay for it, so there's a bit of added value in the pack as well. And, and this, hopefully we get people out here to come see us. Yeah. And this price includes tax as I understand. So yeah, Good I tested deal. It, it, there's no tax and things added after. So Good deal. It's a great deal. It's the good wine gal deal. So thank you. Thank you for, for that. And thank you for all that you did. And thank you for sharing and making this all possible. I know your time is super valuable. I love this picture. I think it's a great way to kind of wrap up is, you know, you can see the elevation going up. You can see the nature of the vineyards. Um, you can see the hospitality and, um, that isn't, that isn't you standing and you won't be doing the tastings, but we know where you are and where you will be. <laughs> and the future's looking bright and busy, isn't it? She's yes. busy wandering it, those vineyards like a goat <laughs> up and down the hills. Oh, I know. Yeah. I've slid down a few too, not wearing the right footwear. Or there's straw or something in like a sprain an ankle and whatever. You just get up and keep going because you got a long way to walk. So how many walk paces? How many paces? Yeah. <laughs> you do your Fitbit. 20, 20. 000. Oh yeah. I, yeah. I, I'd have to look back, but you, you put on some kilometers. Yeah. I bet yeah. you do. So, All and right. So that Gail. concludes. She came in there. Hello, Gail. Hello, Gail. So great to have you with us. Hi. All right. And Catherine. Hi, how are you? Welcome. Yes. Where are you, Catherine? Well, I'm actually at Peak Cellars. That's what I thought. No, it's nice. Yeah, it's just in the room next door. Yeah. Uh, so it may or may not be beside us. 
Well, ladies and gents, that brings us to our conclusion. If there's any questions, please unmute and uh, let us know. I think uh, I think Cassandra's been monitoring the uh, chat, so I think we're all up to speed there. Gail, how are you? Got some notes. I'm good. I'm you good. Had, you had an exciting week in Gastown last week with the fire. Oh, um, it's it's there's it's not going to end. They canceled the demolition today. Rumor, rumor has it there was an in some intruders. Wow. Everybody wants to move to the Okanagan. So if you could make room at Peak Cellars for a few more. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all of Gastown. <laughs> <laughs> I'll reach out because I feel like we're, we're always looking for a lot of different roles. And with the growth that we're going to be experiencing with the new site and all the events and things like that, there is there's there is opportunities. Yes, lots of opportunities. Yeah, your talent could go far. Whoosh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I think we're not question... shy, that's for sure, yeah. right, Gail? We're not shy. No, God, no. No, nope, we're not shy. <laughs> All right. Uh, lovely. Yeah, that see... was great. And I'm I, I... to see the faces. Thank you so much, David. As always, a pleasure to have you with us. Uh, we love your input. Yeah. And I hope you enjoyed that Gruner. It's puzzling him. He's puzzled. Ah. <laughs> do, do tell. Do tell. <laughs> you want to elaborate, it's, David, now that we're... Yeah, I, I'm just finding it that it's not showing the Austrian Gruner Vettler Niss, I guess, that I'm kind of used to with some of the ones that I've had. And I'm thinking it may be Vine Age, it might be Terroir. But I, I said it totally reminds me of more Central Coast California Pinot Blanc, like Chalon or Aubon Clément, the old Jim Clendenin kind of style. It's got a lot more texture and mouthfeel, but it doesn't have that. I always describe Gruner as tasting like you've got a wet river rock tucked in your cheek. Oh, okay. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I've read too, like a lot of classic Gruners um, and the, you know, with the different ones that they make for aging, you can get pink grapefruit. There's sometimes it's like dill, a herbal character, but that classic white pepper. And, and that I think will like, will, will come with time as well. Um, it is only one year in bottle. Um, yeah. And they're young but, vines. Uh, yeah. yeah still, I mean, still pretty young vines. Like that yeah, young, young vines is the big thing for that. And I think age, I have had the fortunate opportunity to, to try some 25, 30 year old Gruner Vetliner, and they taste like Shastan Montrachet. They're fantastic. Wow.